because it's easy to read this and think, oh, what a slimy landlord. But then you reach the part where the landlord's attorney said that they weren't getting both sides of the story. And I thought that that was interesting because I really look at this from the landlord's perspective of if you want to get rid of somebody, this may be a, a reasonable way to, to do it. Nothing will crush a real estate investor's spirit like landlord stress. The difference between being successful and miserable in managing properties is education. Welcome to Landlord University, where landlords learn. Landlord University is recorded from inside the rent prep office, where Stephen White and Jeff Pearson share the lessons learned from working with some of the most successful landlords. Welcome to Landlord University in the News. I'm Jeff Pearson. I'm here with my co-host, Stephen White. Hello, Stephen. How are you doing? Hey, pretty good, Jeff. Um, so, another episode of In the News. Um, just to uh, throw it out there, we've been getting a lot of people... Um, writing into us, asking us questions, a couple of people that have recommended topics, uh, news topics. So anybody that has anything, any listeners out there, uh, want to send us something, got a question, have a topic you want us to cover or a news article, uh, send it to landlordu at rentprep.com. And uh, obviously, uh, a lot of those topics make it into shows and, and we love covering questions and uh, anything that you guys send in. Absolutely. So we've got Jennifer here with us today, obviously. She's our uh, in-the-news uh, regular. So Jennifer, what uh, what have you found for us? Hi, everyone. Uh, well, today we've got a story from San Francisco, which seems to be a, a source of a lot of our landlord-tenant articles. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, there's a tenant in San Francisco. She received a notice of a $6,700 rent hike. Um, she's in a rent-controlled apartment. And she was frustrated, so she posted this on Facebook, and it went viral, and that's how the article, you know, came to my attention. But apparently, this rent hike is legal according to the particular process that her landlord followed. Uh, the rent control in that area protects tenants in multi-unit buildings, but this tenant's downstairs neighbor had moved out, and the landlords converted that space into storage space. So now her apartment is a single unit and the rent protection doesn't apply anymore. So the second part of this interesting dilemma is something that's called a constructive eviction by rent increase. And that's what happens when a landlord is going to do construction on a rental unit and will take the unit out of service. But he or she then raises the rent to an exorbitant amount far above the market rate. So the tenant is basically forced to leave, but they aren't being formally evicted and they the landlord does not pay for relocation. So this tenant will be leaving and she understands that what's happening is legal, but she really wanted to share the story so that other people know that this sort of thing could happen. I just thought that was just a, a really bizarre set of loopholes that uh, I mm -hmm. thought we could really talk about and explore. Yeah. Uh, well, I found a couple of things interesting. So the, the rent increase was astronomical. It, it quadrupled essentially. I didn't understand in the article where they mentioned uh, they're raising the security deposit. I don't know, and they said per month. I don't know if that was a typo or not. Twelve hundred and fifty dollars per month security deposit. But in any event, what I thought the interesting part of the article, because it's easy to read this and think, "Oh, what a slimy landlord!" You know, how can they do this? How can this be legal? But then you reach the part where they mention when they were asked to comment on it. Basically, the landlord's attorney said that uh, they weren't they weren't getting both sides of the story, in other words. And I thought that that was interesting because I really look at this from the landlord's perspective of if you want to get rid of somebody, maybe the relationship's not working, maybe the you know whatever reason that it could be, this may be a, a reasonable way to to do it. I know it may not be the popular answer, but I think in some cases, you know, this may be one of the the most reasonable ways to get rid of somebody. Um, kind of a, I guess, the, the reverse of cash for keys. And maybe I'm wrong here, but almost in a sense, like you know, okay, listen, you're not going to have the eviction on your record. So I think in some ways it could benefit the tenants. Um, you know, if you have a bad situation that that c could potentially get worse. It's one of those strange little things because you know the rent controls are there to protect the tenants so that the evil landlords don't keep <laughs> raising the rent and i i tend to be against um uh, rent control to a, a pretty great extent but at the same time sometimes it does seem a little bit unreasonable but to have a situation where you have rent control on a multi-unit family or a multi-unit property 
that you can just suddenly change that to a single family dwelling and all of a sudden you can raise someone's rent by four times. That is, it's a little bit ridiculous. But you have to give credit to the landlord who said, oh, if I just do this, I can raise my rent and bring it up to current market rates. Now, in San Francisco, there's this whole thing. Everybody, you know, they don't like the fact that they have this gentrification where uh, there are so many, the values have gone up so much that all of the neighborhoods are being completely redone and the prices are going way up. And I understand that. It's a difficult thing for people who've lived there for years and years and years. And all of a sudden, your, your average rents are four, five, six thousand dollars $6,000 for a, a one-bedroom apartment. Essentially, the landlord just found a way to take advantage of the fact that rents have gone way up. You, you feel bad for the tenant. I understand. It's a tough thing. You know, at the same time, this is a Chinese medical practitioner who treats cancer patients. So you have to think the person's making decent money. I, I don't know if they're a doctor or if they practice Chinese medicine. It's not quite clear because they, they work at an oncology center. So I kind of think they're some type of a, of a doctor. But at the same time, you know, it's a tough thing. When you're a tenant and all of a sudden someone comes in and says your rent's going to go up four times right. from what it was. But at the same time, a four-time increase. So they were paying twenty one forty five for a two-bedroom apartment. Well, I live in San Jose. You know, it's away from San Francisco. And our rents aren't as high as San Francisco, although they're pretty high. I don't think you can find a two-bedroom apartment for twenty one forty five around here. So that person had a great deal. That's where you start to wonder, you know, I, I understand the benefits of rent control for the tenants, but at the same time, it has, there has to be some, some reasonable factor in this. So all the, ten, all the landlord ended up doing was taking advantage of what was available to them. Yeah, and I'm, I'm thinking too, um, so let me put this question to, to, to either one of you. Let's say that you were in this situation, you're the landlord, um, you're, let's, let me just paint the scenario that you're having problems with the with this tenant, the remaining tenant, and maybe the tenant's hard to deal with, uh, causing problems with neighbors. Maybe it's not something like, you know, as obvious as damage to the properties or she's not paying the rent, but she's just kind of a pain in the neck tenant. That's, and again, I don't know if that's the case, but that's sort of the impression that I was getting uh, from the attorney's comment that said that basically you're not, you're not getting both sides of the story here. So if that is the case, is it worth doing this and, and using this loophole to avoid the very costly relocation payment that uh, that the landlord you know may be responsible for it's fifty five hundred dollars right so you know again you know from the landlord's perspective if you're dealing with a you know pain pain in the neck tenant uh, is this an effective way you know I, I guess that's the question or is it ethical <laughs> I don't know I see what you're saying you know the whole concept of you know, in when you don't have rent control and you don't have this Ellis Act relocation payment that would be fifty five hundred dollars. If you have a problem tenant, you follow the legal process and you evict the tenant. Whereas in this case, it would cost you money to evict the tenant. So rather than do that, they just made this change. And I I understand what you're saying, and I I I'm not opposed to that. I definitely get where it looks bad. You yeah. I mean? <laughs> yep. It puts us into that evil landlord right. category when, when landlords do those things. But, yeah. you know, this, we, we keep talking about this as a business. Yeah. You know, and the city of San Francisco does not tell McDonald's you can't raise the price of your Big Mac because our, our residents can't afford to pay three fifty or $5 or whatever it is that they charge for a Big Mac. But as landlords, we have these controls, and these controls aren't, as far as I know, they're not related to reality. So you get somebody who's paying $2,145 for rent in a place where that should be going, well, obviously, they can raise it to $8,900. So it was four times below market value. And at what point is the government, with these laws, putting a landlord in a situation where they have to take these somewhat extreme measures. I mean, this is kind of extreme, Mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's within the letter of the law from everything I can tell. Now, Jennifer, again, this may not be the popular view. This is a situation I read this and I'm thinking, man, that's an extra bottle of wine for my attorney at Christmas or something. I mean, this is like a genius attorney (laughs) move, like a legal strategy. You know, this is something that if my attorney comes up with, I think, oh my God, you're, this is, you know, genius. How did you think of this? But 
But again, I realize it could be looked at as sort of deviant too. So Jennifer, what's What's your take? You seem to be a very reasonable person, so I'm interested in your your perspective on this. Oh, you're so nice. Um, <laughs> I I think it's a, a a win-win for both sides, other than the fact that the tenant does have to move. But sure. but you're right. I mean, it's a 60 day notice. That's plenty of time to find something. Right. Uh, the landlord has a right to earn market value profit from his or her um, property, mm-hmm. and I think you're right. I think I mean that. That rent that she was paying, it said that she'd been there for 11 years, the mm-hmm. tenant. Um, you know, so if you're not growing and changing with the times, then there's a point where a landlord's not making much money with that. Um, I, I think it's a it's a nice um, way to maneuver, to, to be in compliance with the law, to give plenty of fair notice. I mean, it sounds like they're remodeling. What the, the article said what they did with the downstairs is they took a bunch of stuff out from the – when the – downstairs tenant moved and started changing some of that around and it sounds like that's what they're going to do to the top they're going to completely redo it um you know to make it worth this new rent so Mm -hmm. i that's within the landlord's right to do that and i think as long as it's compliant with the law i'm fine with it you know it's not like they gave her you know 15 days to go and made it crazy i mean it they they're following the law right. and it works both ways. So I'm, I'm with it. I, I thought it was pretty clever actually. Yeah. And I think in there's rare cases, this being one of them where, cause I'm usually not the type of person that stands on one side or the other. Like I said, Jennifer, I think you're a pretty reasonable person. I think Jeff, you too, where we all kind of have, you know, the side of reason, but there are some issues that, you know, it's, you have to you have to have a different perspective on it. And what I thought was interesting about this uh, this article was she posted it on Facebook. She took a picture of the letter. It goes viral. You know, you start and I've you know I'm sure we've all read the posts too. And then all of a sudden the evil landlord um, you know persona sort of emerges and everybody's jumping on the bandwagon. This is wrong and how could this happen? So I think there's a lot of speculation when you get into that territory where people are just assuming the land, you know, the landlord's the the wrong one. This person's being displaced. This is an injustice. But again, if they're allowed to uh, to make some assumptions, let's make some assumptions on our end too. Maybe this again, this was a troublesome landlord, which sounds or a troublesome tenant, which sounds like may have been the case. You know, Jennifer, you made a good point. She's given sixty days notice. Um, if if she was facing an eviction. She may not have that luxury, and then she's also got the uh, the eviction on her record. Um, so this may have been a situation, like you said, that could have really been a win win. Um, you know, without knowing the full side of the story, I guess I you know I don't know, but but this seems like one of those things where it's going to create a really bad image of landlords because <laughs> of course, <laughs> yeah, because you're talking about displacing people, and uh, you know it's easy to look at that one element of it, but you know as a landlord. Or as anybody who's ever managed people, managed properties, um, it's easy to see how this could be a really interesting loophole and uh, one that I think most would probably take advantage of if they had the chance. Yes. Very interesting. Wow. All right. Cool. And if anybody has some thoughts about that, it'd be interesting to get people's opinions about it. So feel free to send us an email at landlordu at rentprep.com. Let us know what you think on that. Jennifer, tell us about our next story. Right. Our next story comes from Connecticut. And what happened was the Connecticut Supreme Court, they've recently ruled on a tragic accident that may actually find the landlord liable for something that his tenants have done. What happened was a 10-year-old child brought a cinder block from elsewhere on the property to their third-story balcony, and they threw it off and hit another child below. And what the court determined was that the landlord may be liable because he should have known that leaving construction material around the property may have contributed to somebody getting injured. Uh, Apparently, from the article, the property did have some abandoned material like home furnishings and appliances and so forth. And the court basically felt that the landlord should have foreseen that something could happen, although, of course, it would be really hard to predict that particular accident. So this is a really complex case that I'd love to hear what you guys have to say about it. Yeah, we you know we talked about this case off the air uh, last week. Jeff, you had brought this to our attention, and, and it created a lot of good conversation <laughs> yeah. then because because it you know at, at first glance, of course, when you read it, you're thinking, oh my god, this is you know it's, it's a terrible tragedy. First off, um, but it is sort of outrageous to think that you're going to hold the landlord responsible. This you know we all agreed that okay, it would make a lot more sense if the cinder block was on the third story balcony if it was left there. Exactly. Okay, I, I get that that 
you know, that's pretty pretty easy to determine in that situation. But this kid grabbed the cinder block from outside, carried it three flights up through his house, at, you know, at which point – and again, it, it, they're claiming in the article that the boy was well-supervised, which is obviously debatable if he made it through the whole <laughs> complex carrying an 18-pound cinder block. I got to imagine that's not something that usually goes unnoticed. Um, but he carries it up there and then drops it off. I have a really hard time thinking that the landlord has any liability in this. And again, it may not be the popular uh, answer, but it's just – it you know, it's so hard to, to make that connection. And, you know, they do make a good case in saying that there was some construction debris outside the property. Um, I think that maybe should be held separately. You know, I, I feel like that, I don't know if you can connect the dots here between this. Am I, am I wrong or, or do you feel the same way? I tend to agree with you. Uh, you know, as we were talking last week, when we first started talking about this article, my first impression was that the cinder block was sitting on the balcony, that there was a bunch of construction material on the balcony. And then you guys pointed out, no, this kid carried this thing up the stairs. And, you know, I, I think of the things I did when I was a kid, and I the idea that just because this stuff is laying around and somebody could could possibly carry it up three flights of stairs and then drop it on his little cousin it just doesn't make sense. And it is, it's a terrible tragedy. You know, the seven-year-old kid who has traumatic brain injuries after getting hit by a cinder block, it's a terrible thing. But at what point does it make sense to put this on the landlord? And where we're, where we're at on this particular case is they're going to end up settling. This isn't going to go to court. The landlord's insurance company is going to end up paying for this through the settlement because they're afraid to take it to court because who knows what the what the results would be if they put it in front of a jury it's it's interesting to see um well it says well a trial court dismissed the claim ruling the defendant couldn't have foreseen the particular threat of a child dropping a cinder block on someone else's head not even, not to mention that the kid would have carried it up three steps three flights of stairs to do it but an appeal court reversed and the supreme court agreed citing the landlord's negligence in allowing threats to proliferate prolifer, proliferate on the property. So I think what they're saying there is it's not this not that there was a cinder block laying around, but obviously they felt that there was so much stuff, so much construction stuff that wasn't properly protected from from mm-hmm. kids that yeah. they feel that there was a problem. But still, the fact that the kid carried it up three flights of the stairs to me is the big thing. If this stuff was sitting on a balcony or even, you know, around the corner on that same on that same floor and the kid mm-hmm. just walked out to the balcony, I could see that. For us as landlords, the biggest thing to take away from this is don't leave your construction construction stuff laying around. Keep your property neat and clean so that you don't put yourself in this type of a predicament. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, a couple of things we, we talked last week, too, about, um, you know, the fact that the, uh, the I, what we thought was the obvious reason why the insurance company was willing to settle before it went to Supreme Court, because anytime you've got a case where you've got a young child with a traumatic brain injury, they never wanted to put that, you know, in front of a jury. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so, you know, maybe a good idea on the insurance's part to you know, to, to try and hedge some of their losses and their investment into it and settle out. But a couple of things worries me about that. Um, does that create precedence for other cases? Obviously, they won it, the, you know, in the uh, or the the first uh, round of, of lawsuits turned it down. But is this going to be something that in the future may hold landlords responsible for similar acts? What do you guys think about that? Well, an interesting point that they make in the article, they say, you know, in the future to make a play area truly safe, landlords will have to keep them constantly free of decorative rocks, bird baths, lawn ornaments, lawn furniture, sprinklers, garden tools, stones from a stone wall, and countless other items. What if this kid had picked up a rock from the decorative rock structure down on the first floor and carried that rock up and dropped that on his cousin? Would the landlord be similarly liable? Right. And it may sound crazy, but I think, again, you know, here's another article of a good example of a of a landlord with a pretty decent attorney. Uh, I feel like the the one uh, paragraph in here mentions that the, uh, the, you know, in defense, the attorney brought to attention that one of the cinder blocks was being used to secure a basketball stand, uh, which could arguably mean that it increased the safety of the backyard. Right. Uh, that, that it stabilized <laughs> the, the uh 
the the basketball stand. I thought that that was great that the attorney be able to grab that out of there, but makes a pretty decent point for it. You know, I mean, it, it's tough, and it you're is. right. I mean, and I think I think the landlord did not do themselves any service by keeping such a terrible property because there were abandoned cars. This right. place was a mess, and so you would think. The, the type of listeners that we have would not have their property in that type of estate. But at the same time, this does set some type of precedence for us as landlords being more liable for things that we wouldn't think twice about. I guess the uh, good rule of thumb would be, you know, I, I'm looking at this as a parent now. I would have cleaned it up. I wouldn't want my kid getting, I got a 10 year old. Yes. I wouldn't want him getting into it. So, you know, we were always saying, you know, be thoughtful in that way, and I think that's probably a case where the, the landlord could have been more thoughtful, certainly, and cleaned that stuff up and, and recognized it as a hazard to, to children. And uh, for that, I do agree he was negligent. I don't know if I can say he was directly liable or he should feel any necessarily guilt for the fact that the kid brought it up three flights of stairs and, and threw it off, and, and, uh, and he's somehow responsible for it. Right. It's kind of like the, uh, the pass interference rules in football. You know, sometimes it's a, what, 15-yard penalty, and sometimes you get it at the spot of the foul, and what's the difference? This is a type of situation where, uh, yeah, might he be liable for some type of, of fines for not keeping his property properly kept? Right. As opposed to being liable for the injury that occurred to the kid as a result of his cousin or her cousin going up three flights of stairs. That's the part that still to me doesn't make any sense. And I think he's being punished because he didn't keep his property clean where if this was a perfectly well-kept property and the kid just happened to grab a rock from the garden and carry it upstairs, it would have been a different case. Would you guys have a different opinion if this accident, something similar had happened on the ground floor, everything else being the same and say the 10 year old was sort of picking up the cinder block and like swinging it around sort of discus style or whatever and, and mm -hmm. hit his cousin, would your opinion change on it? It's a good question. Um, yeah. I, I, For me to a certain extent, yes. Yeah. Same here. I think that's a really good question. I see where we're going with it, Jennifer. I, you know, I, that's a tough call. It definitely puts it into it a really different is. perspective too. You know, I don't know. That'd be a good argument to make um, because my well, first. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I'll say my first reaction is, yeah, that changes it, but does it really? Well, you know, I go back to when I was a kid. You know, we we threw rocks. We got in trouble for it. We threw rocks. At what point is the landlord responsible or liable for the rocks in the in the garden, the rock garden? You know, you're using rocks all, along the side of the walkway. Uh, to keep the weeds at bay and keep it looking nice and you've got a nice looking place and you've got rocks as opposed to cinder block. And again, the the landlord is certainly responsible to have a clean, well-kept property. And if you have construction debris, it needs to be taken care of. If you're in the middle of, of construction, you need to properly account for those materials and, and keep them well-kept. But I agree with, with you, Steve. The question that Jennifer answered or qu brought up, it really makes you question the whole thing. But at the same time, the idea of carrying it up three stories, to me, changes this. If it right. was on the ground floor and, yeah, the kid was swinging that around, there would definitely, to me, there would be a different liability or there would be more of a liability to the landlord. Right. Because it's it's not unreasonable to expect that a kid is going to throw a rock or swing a rock on the ground floor as opposed to taking it up three flights of stairs. And Jennifer, were you asking that? Because I'm sure in a you know in a court situation as an attorney, it would if you were able to make that connection, it would probably be easier to bridge the gap between the kid taking it up to the third floor now. You know, well, you're... that's what I was wondering if that's why the court, you know, looking sort of at the overall thing, you know, mm -hmm. there's all this junk, you know, I mean, we could have been talking about, you know, slicing a hand open on the abandoned car or, you know, mm -hmm. something like that. You know what? I've just wondered if they just sort of took the large picture and said mm -hmm. junk plus children 
equals all kinds of crazy scenarios. Um, it uh, happened on yeah. the property from junk on the property by children that live on this property. So I wonder if it's just sort of an A plus B equals C, regardless of the specifics of whether it was dropped or, mm -hmm. you know, pushed right. off a slide or whatever. I'm just, I'm wondering right. if that was maybe more the view that they took it was less on how it happened, but that it happened. Right. But well, if, if you've got a cinder block on the first floor, what is the likelihood that the kid is going to to be sure. able to lift it up or throw it to the uh, to the extent sure. that it would cause this type of an injury? Mm -hmm. But if there is a slide around, all of a sudden you're in a different situation. Yeah, the kid can climb up the slide and drop it off the slide. That right. would change it. So it's it's a really good question. I definitely understand what you were thinking when you asked that, and it really makes makes you think. Yeah, and you know, I thought it was interesting in the article they brought up, a, you know, kind of a, a famous precedence in law where, you know, they linked a, a disconnected act of liability um, to an incident where somebody had lit a firecracker, threw it into a crowd, uh, the firecracker got passed around like a hot potato, you know, from one person to the next. Finally, it exploded uh, in one person's hands, and um, you know, in the court they argued and reasonably so that the last person that touched the firecracker was the one who you know uh, was the reason was the the person who would be liable since he was the last person that touched it um you know he'd be the reason for the injuries but the court reasonably concluded that the person who first lit it and threw it in the cloud uh, crowd was to blame he was the cause of it so it's that disconnected uh you know liability and i could see where they would try and use that uh in this case where the landlord didn't certainly didn't force the kid, you know, to to walk it up three flights of stairs and, and drop a cinder block, but he created a, the environment for that to happen too. Yeah. So, yeah. and I really think that because he did not properly keep his property um, maintained and he had all of that junk, that's the reason why he's being found liable. Yeah, I'll tell you, it's crazy. When we first talked about this article, just in this uh, short time that we've been talking on the air here, I think I've almost changed my mind on it. <laughs> this would, this, no wonder the the insurance didn't take this thing to court. They would have lost in a heartbeat. I, I I feel like there's, you could easily make a case. It, that would have been really tough to to fight. I think in the Supreme Court. Now they do mention later in this article that there are cases that went the other way. There was a Virginia yeah. Supreme Court decision that found a campground did not have a duty to remove rocks that a 12 year old dropped on the plaintiff from an observation tower. Mm. So here's a kid that picked up a rock, went up on top of an observation tower and dropped the rock and right. the campground was not found liable. And so it's, it is tough. And I agree. You, you can look at it on both sides of this. You know, to me as a landlord, the big thing that it points out is at least make sure you keep your property in good condition and you don't have junk lying around. Right. Here, here's a pretty good idea. It kills two birds with one stone. I just, just this past summer, I laid some, uh, some landscaping rocks out, right? They were uh -huh. like, you know, probably baseball sized or whatever, without thinking that they would be projectile missiles. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> I, was th I was thinking more in the situation of my 10 year old who runs around the yard and plays hockey and usually, you know, ends up knocking rocks all over the place. And I got sick of moving them back into place. I, I took a bag of, um, you know, a quick creek concrete and just dry, you know, just poured the, the, the concrete mix uh, into the rocks and figured when it rains, it's going to, you know, turn it to concrete and they'll start to settle and it worked perfectly. The, the rocks stayed in place and you can't move them now. So Perfect. A, yeah, Good idea. yeah, I killed two birds with one stone there. No, they're no longer a projectile missile and they stay in place. And look good. <laughs> so, yeah, I, that's what scares me about it from a landlord's perspective. Does everything that can be picked up and thrown now become a deadly weapon in a sense, you know? You so, have to you have to look around your property with that in mind. Yeah. That almost yeah. needs to be a part of your annual inspection. Right. Right. May not you know, learning about these things, having these things in the back of your mind is never a bad idea because hopefully it causes somebody to go out to their property one day during an inspection, stop by, whatever the case is, see something that causes them to do something, pick it up, clean it up, whatever, and uh reduce the risk of it. Just use common sense, you know, create a good environment for people to live in and hopefully uh you know you're you're on the right side of the law if you're as long as you're doing that mindfully yes 
Well, great, Stephen and Jennifer. Thank you very much. Look forward to talking about some more articles next week. Thanks, guys. You're welcome. Thanks. Thanks for listening to Landlord University. And remember to visit rentprep.com slash landlordu to see show notes and access free resources like forms and guides. And be sure to check out Jeff Pearson hosting his own hit podcast at The Mentor Impact 